Um, um, I lived in New York City and New Jersey for 12 years and uh, worked on the AT&T network for most of that time. And then for the last couple of years, I worked for our CTO on some projects, mostly in the open source space. And um, after coming back in 2015, back to Europe, um, you know, we, we, we decided there's some really great stuff happening out there that could probably be better than outside of a large company. And uh, so we decided to kind of uh, join forces with some folks um, who have done development for Cisco previously and uh, build a company. Um, so my company, the, the company that, that we built is Springs. And, uh, you know, it, it's, we're working in this network control space. And um, over the course of those last 22 years, uh, I've been able to meet a lot of people um, in that uh, internet space that have been, you know, uh, you know, in the middle of this developing, designing it. Um, and uh, I was always really interested in the, in the origin story. And I felt like there's, there's nowhere is a good place to hear that. So I kind of, I started to assemble things and, uh, the result of that is the following, you know, the following, uh, I don't know, 60, 90 minutes. Um, and, uh, the goal here is to, you know, talk about the real history. So what was the drivers? What was, who were the, the key people who were in charge of, uh, who made those decisions that led us to have the internet? They're going to talk. Uh, about the protocol years, which is kind of the, the mid, the mid life, uh, the development, the scale of the internet. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about software design, defined networking, disaggregation, open source, and, and these kind of things. Before I jump right into it, um, uh, um, my suggestion is to kind of have a Q and a session right after, uh, the presentation, anything else, Thomas, that you would like me to uh, consider before. <laughs> Go and uh, start. No, nothing. We have two hours, so take the time. Super, super. Very well. Okay. All right. The story actually starts even earlier than the 60s. It starts in 1947. And it was those three gentlemen here. Um, a team led by William Shockley um, and the other gentlemen are John Bardeen and Walter Breton that in 1947 developed the point contact transistor. They did this in uh, Bell Labs, which was the research organization of AT&T, um, the quasi monopolistic telecom provider in the US up to the 80s. And uh, Bell Labs was a real powerhouse of uh, intellectual you know, capacity. It was a fantastic place. Um, so um, it was in New Jersey. And uh, if you ever go there, um, I really encourage you to visit uh, Holmdale. Um, Holmdale. Holmdale is an office park. Um, and, uh, you know, it's built by a very famous architect. And they have a water tower in the form of a transistor. And currently, it's no longer used uh, as an office building, but it's really sell it's redeveloped. And but it, it shows you a little bit of the you know the depth uh, that 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 company had. So they developed this in '47, and the three got awarded the Nobel Prize for that discovery in '56. So Shockley uh, was at the height of his um, fame. Everybody knew him. He basically could do anything could get anybody that he wanted to, which he did. So he went to the best universities in the US and, and got the best people that he could find. And he, he founded a company called Shockley Semiconductors. Now, um, that was in 1956. Now, what we should mention though is that uh, Shockley was a terrible person. He was not only a racist, but like a horrible manager. It, it was, it was a, a, a terrible person. And these young, bright people really found out pretty soon that they didn't want to work for that kind of, uh, that kind of person. And they decided uh, they would go build their own things. And just one year after Chocolate Semiconductor got founded, 
um, eight people of that company left and started to build Fairchild Semiconductor, another seminal company in, in that space. Now, what's important to say as well is the really interesting decision that Shockley made in, in locating his new company was he decided to go not to, not to put this company on the East Coast, typically Massachusetts or uh, uh, New Jersey, where the key central intellectual hubs of that time, but he decided to go to California, to a relatively unknown place, Mountain View. Uh, at that time, there were a couple of defense contractors and a, a couple of other companies, but nothing of substance. There was certainly no money there. There was no VC companies there yet. Uh, all of that didn't exist yet. So, um, but he made the decision um, and that was present in, in many ways. So, so although he was a, a horrible person, <laughs> he had a couple of really, really remarkable things, decisions uh, that he did. So, all right. So uh, it's 1957 and eight people split off of Shockley Semiconductors and they are called the Traitorous Eight. Um, they betrayed Shockley, um, uh, but they found they found it. Uh, Fairchild Semiconductor which was very successful. Uh, I think there's some version of that still exists. And um, there's two people most notably from that group that I want to highlight. One is Robert Noyce and the other one is Gordon Moore. And those two people went and in 1968 they founded Intel. And as we know, Intel has been a company mostly centered around RAM, uh, storage RAM development at that point in time. And then later moved on to develop CPUs. And, you know, as we know today, that was a pretty smart decision. If you ever get, if you ever get uh, into uh, Silicon Valley area, please go to Mountain View, drive through Mountain View. Not only is like the Google uh, of this world there, but also uh, when you go to San Antonio Road, uh, you will see the old building of Shockley Semiconductors, where there's some sculptures out there in the form of diodes and transistors and some, you know, signs uh, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the pavement. So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a great, great place to visit. I, I should mention, if you have not been to, um, to Silicon Valley, I think the great thing there is, um, it feels on the one hand really boring because there's a whole bunch of small places and it's really hard to, to get the thing. But then on the other hand, it's really, really exciting because all the, major developments uh, that have been made there and all the, the major decisions that are being uh, done there. So check it out if you can. Um, now, the next big thing uh, happened in 57 uh, that I wanna mention here. Sputnik was launched and it completely uh, caught everybody in the US completely off guard. It completely threw them off and, uh, and there was a realization that uh, the folks outside of the US, uh, the Russians, are by far, far more advanced than anybody thought that they would be. And clearly the immediate threat was if they can put, you know, this ball, this little ball that sent some radio signals and got everybody crazy. Um, if they could send this ball in orbit, they can also send a, you know, um, a missile, a warhead into orbit. And that was kind of a, you know, the, the real threat behind it. That, these guys were so advanced, not only in rocket technology, but also all the supporting technologies to be able to do that in 1957. So what's the input? What's the importance of that? Because of that shock, and it was a real shock, it kind of completely caught them by surprise. Uh, the, the, the government did something extraordinary. They funded um, a, a huge research arm, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. And it was got funded in 58, so relatively quickly, just one year after that Sputnik shock. And it was kind of funded with uh, 520 million uh, and a budget plan of 2 billion of uh, $1985. So it, an enormous amount of money was available for that. A year later, NASA was spun off and most of that money was put into NASA. So that ARPA really was kind of really focused on this high touch, super esoteric projects. And, um, that the long shots, the moonshot projects, and NASA was really focused on the rocketry. All right. So um, now I'm gonna take you 
from uh, the US, I want to take you over to Europe uh, at that time. And the, everybody knows Alan Turing uh, and his achievements around cracking the codes of, uh, of the Germans and building computer to do that. And one of the folks that were in that team was uh, a guy called Donald Davis. And there is a, you know, there's a, there's the story that Davis was uh, pointed out some mistakes in, uh, in Turing's paper um, on computable numbers. And uh, supposedly, uh, supposedly, Turing was not very happy with that. He was not somebody to be criticized uh, lightly. So he didn't have a, a strong appreciation for Davis. But uh, Turing also didn't really succeed in getting his automatic computing engine off the ground because it was somewhat too ambitious. And Davis kind of took that project over and made it happen. And that was certainly a, a claim to fame. And then he started in the 60s to move from that achievement and started to look into um, what he coined packet switching. He realized that the, the cost it, it, it would take to keep phone lines open and have you know, terminals talk to mainframes would be, um, would be too high. So they found, tried to find a solution to kind of use those phone lines more effectively. And in the context of that, he came up with a paper that he presented for the first time in August 1968, um, and where he termed uh, the, coined the term packet switching. But it was really Davis' paper that was extremely important for the folks at ARPA, um, but more about that later. All right. There is a second gentleman that is definitely noteworthy and, and important to mention, uh, which is Paul Baron. Um, he was an American engineer. He was uh, Polish born, but um, worked in, in the US. And um, he did a work, he, he joined Rand Corporation in 1959. And over the next years, he worked on the concept of survivability and, and started to simulate networks and looked at their behavior under link failures. Now, that part, that, uh, that project uh, within Rand Corporation by Baran was in the context of survivability of, um, you know, um, nuclear uh, situations um, or nuclear strikes. So what they usually, what they had back then where they had high frequency radios uh, that would basically be able to survive um, strikes and, and what he modeled was kind of radios in lower frequencies and with packet switching instead of those, um, you know, uh, static circuit switched lines. So he didn't call it packet switching, Baran, Baran called it message blocks, but it, in, sense, in essence, it was the same concept that he started to develop that Davis already uh, had the, uh, was developing. So it might have been a little bit earlier with Baran, but uh, Davis' work was, was the first time um, mentioning the packet switching. Now they talked later on and they exchanged and they basically acknowledged that they both came to the same concept ind uh, independently. Um, so they kind of gave each other the credit for it. Now, I do want to highlight that it was uh, Davis' work, so the non-military work, that really caught the attention of the ARPA guys. And that's where pretty well documented, and, and you'll see um, why that is credible a little bit later on as well. So those two kind of papers are really the foundation for packet switching mostly David's term, David's term, and the network and the survivability of networks and everything that came after much the link state protocols and so on. That was really more where David, where Baran, sorry, where Baran was, was coming from. All right. Now, what I do want to mention is um, that we'll come back to that a little bit later. Baran later in the 80s formed a company called Packet Cable and, and Packet Cable uh, spun off Stratacom. And Stratacom was a company that was very successful with service providers producing frame relay and ATM switches in the 90s. And it, uh, Cisco uh, bought Stratacom, and that was really the beginning of the uh, 
um, you know, the uh, service provider business for Cisco back there. <laughs> Hello, but we added Stratacom also, you know, triggered the largest network outage ever. Um, uh, you know, it was a little bit before my time in the US, but, uh, you know, it was a two day network outage. Um, it was the worst thing ever. Uh, actually, Stratacom had a, had a network management system and AT&T had this deployed worldwide, globally, an ATM network, ATM frame network globally, and it was about 96. And uh, they went into a software upgrade and, uh, and they ran into an issue after the software upgrade. And so they tried to back out of that software upgrade and they deployed the back out globally, but the back out didn't work. And the situation was so bad that it would take individuals going to those pops physically and kind of loading the, you know, the correct version in it, which resulted literally in a two day uh, network outage. You know, you can't even Im imagine that today, but um, it was as bad, uh, you know, as it could get. Um, actually, I, I knew the engineer who was like in the middle of that quite well. He worked with us later and because he survived that and he was able to fix it ultimately, he was also very much respected by, by AT&T and, and us fellow colleagues. Um, it was not the end of his career. It was really, you know, he proved himself in that extraordinary situation. But everybody was hands on deck for many days in a row without sleeping. Um, it was quite something. Okay, so um, we talked about David's paper. We talked about the Baran paper. Um, and by the way, if you have a chance, so I'll send you this presentation. I'll make it available. Thomas will make it available for you. There are links to, to much of this stuff, or you can Google it, obviously. But have a look at this paper. It's so good. Like all the papers in the world, this is like short. Uh, it's, it has all the essentials in it. Uh, you understand it even without being a subject matter expert. Um, it's, it's fantastic. You should read it. Do yourself uh, some service and, and read that paper. Um, all right. Now, Davis and Byron were certainly the, the, the mathematicians, the, the, you know, the hardcore technologists uh, who are dealing with, you know, how do we break this in packets? How do we, what's the probability of the arrival? What's the, you know, the, the math behind it to make it work? What's the survivability? How many links do we need to, to have certain survivability numbers and, and so on. Um, but then there was another group of people and, and those were led by a guy called, or the, the most important one of those was uh, a guy called Licklider, JCR um, Licklider. And, um, and, and this guy was really definitely far ahead of his time. And what these guys were interested in is what would all this stuff do if we had it? We don't have it yet, but like if we put this in place, what could we do with that stuff? Because imagine it's 1968, people have, you know, typewriters everywhere. Nobody's using, nobody's heard of a computer really for a, a workplace. There were computers, but they were like in some, you know, science lab or in some, you know, hi, hidden away places in large buildings. But at this point in time, nobody could envision how you would work with a computer, but these guys did. And, and, and if you just read the first sentence of this 1968 paper that Licklider wrote with Taylor, um, is they say, in a few years, man will be able to communicate more effectively through a machine than face to face. Then now this sounds obvious and this is like a complete clear outcome. But in 1968, that was not obvious. That was really, really thinking far ahead. And, and these guys would then put the energy and focus on it to make that future that, we, that they were envisioning actually happen. And there was one more, one more person that I would, well, one more event that I'd like to highlight. Uh, and it's, it's uh, the mother of all demos. And I really, I encourage you uh, to watch it. It, it happened in, in, in 1968, and it's a guy called Douglas Engelbart, uh, who basically was so far ahead of his time and was able to all put it together in a way that others could understand it. And the, the, the way he did it wasn't, he didn't write a paper, he didn't you know, describe it in a lecture, he did a demo. And that was kind of a new thing as well, a, a technology demo. And, and 
and the concepts that he introduced at that demo in 1968 was the mouse, um, uh, projectors of um, terminals, the concept of windows, the concept of hypertext, graphics, together with word processing, efficient navigation and command input, video conferencing, and dynamic file linking, revision control, and collaborative real-time editor, and video conferencing. It's freaking mind-blowing. It's the stuff that we deal with as completely normal day-to-day, -day, but to be able to envision it with that kind of clarity in 1968 and do a demo and show it to people is just, it blows your mind. And I really encourage you, watch that demo. It's very inspiring. There is, by the way, there is a, a long version and there's a short version and the short version will do. Okay. All right. How do we do it? Okay. You know, this gentleman Licklider wrote this paper um, that I mentioned you before. Um, and uh, mentioned before. And... Um, uh, and that was Bob Taylor. And Bob Taylor, and I'm not exaggerating, guys and gals, I, Bob Taylor might uh, truly be the most important uh, person in technology history for the last, I don't know, uh, 60 years or so. You know, all the credit goes to the Steve Jobs and, and all these other luminaries. But this guy, in terms of decisions and impact, um, I think beats them all. And here's why. So Bob Taylor um, had a thesis, wrote a thesis in uh, psychoacoustics. Um, so he was certainly coming from um, technical, but, but not the hardcore computer science background, although he certainly was, uh, was working as a computer scientist at that time. But um, what really drove him, so he was working at ARPA, together with Licklider, and, and he had three terminals connected to three um, hosts uh, in different universities and MIT and, and UC Santa Clara and so on. And he had those coming with three terminals into his office. And he realized that there are communities forming on each, around each of those hosts, each of those mainframe computers at the time. So there were com people working on solving problems, but they really didn't cross connect between those hosts. So, you know, his idea at the time was, wouldn't it be awesome, first of all, if I only have one terminal and could you know, attach to all three hosts, which was literally like, can I have one terminal and get to all these hosts? And if we connect all these hosts, wouldn't we you know, also connect people potentially and, and have a chance that these people would kind of work on, on the same problems maybe and uh, there would be a community you know, spanning uh, multiple hosts, you know. And because he was a really good manager in a positive sense, meaning he was able to get resources in terms of funds and, you know, he was, he knew the right people who would be able to pull it off. So he got the funds and he got the people and he put this program in place and he got ARPA to create an RFQ, a request for quotations for a project that would later become the ARPANET. Now, I'm going to come back later to the ARPANET in a moment, but uh, I still want to want to kind of dive into Bob Taylor's uh, a little Bob Taylor a little bit. Uh, Bob Taylor was the driving force behind the ARPANET. Without him, there would have been no ARPANET, and later on, no internet in that form. But he, after he left uh, his job at, at the at the ARPA, he did some stuff for. Uh, in the context of the Vietnam War, he did some data analysis there. Those were the, the, those times. But then he later went to Park, the, the Palo Alto Research Center uh, for Xerox. Xerox, back then, a huge company because they had these copiers. It was cutting edge technology at the time. They had huge cash flow and they would put it in, the, in, this, in this new um, visionary project. So they would put Taylor on a project uh, that would create the first computer uh, with an Ethernet port, with a mouse, and with a windowing system. There was him. 
that was him who funded, who was managing that project and who was putting that project together. So we have the first strike, ARPANET. Second strike is the PARC, the Alto computer with Ethernet, first computer to use Ethernet, mouse, and windowing system. And the third strike, he later went to tech, where he finally was also responsible for the Alta Vista search engine. So I think you'll be hard pressed to find anybody with a better track record in technology who is less known than Bob Taylor. So this is a really, really, it's, I'm, 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 I'm always super excited by this guy. Uh, he passed away but uh, a couple of years ago. All right. Now, um, so I mentioned to you, um, this is a good example for a good manager. Like there are managers like that, that usually when we say manager, we, we mean it in a derogatory way, right? Uh, but there are really examples for good management, which is getting the resources in place, getting the people in place and let them do great stuff and get out of their way. And, and he did that. And, and one of the people that he knew was able to pull it off, meaning the ARPANET, was Larry Roberts. Larry was actually working at MIT and was doing some work there in packet switching. In fact, he had a two node setup running that we did packet switching between two hosts. Um, topologically not very exciting, as you can imagine, but he basically had a proof point that that packet switching, this assembly and reassembly of packet of message blocks into packets on a wire would actually work. So he got Larry Roberts in. And there's the story where <laughs> Roberts would say, no, he had a great job and he loved his job. He didn't want to move. Um, and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, the way that, that, uh, Bob Taylor convinced Roberts was to go to his boss and say, he, you, you know what, uh, by the way, we got your funding. So, you know, if you want to get some funding next year, you know, you better send us Roberts and, uh, and, <laughs> and which ended up with, uh, with Roberts, um, no, coming to the realization it might not be such a bad uh, thing to go and do it. Uh, they certainly strong armed him into it. Um, he didn't want to build the ARPANET, but ultimately he did, and that was a good thing. And one of the folks uh, that worked with him was Vint Cerf, um, a gentleman that we'll come to talk about uh, later on. Okay. Okay. So it's 1968, they put this RFQ out, RFQ, Request for Quotation, um, basically um, saying, hey, you guys, um, we have these requirements for a device. Um, can you guys build a device that would kind of receive and send packets between hosts? In the beginning four and then later on uh, about 12 hosts uh, were part of these ARPANET phases. And and it was sent to 140 companies. And by the way, AT&T refused, IBM refused, all, all the large companies, um, you know, that we are very much, you know, uh, excited about themselves. They kind of either didn't win it or refused because they didn't understand it. And there was this small company, this small outlet in Massachusetts on the East Coast um, that uh, it, close to Boston that got that won the RF, uh, the RFQ. So it was the, a company called Bolt, Baranek and Newman that got this RFQ, they got the deal and they got the, the, the money to build the first internet message processor, the first imp. And the first imp was in effect, the first router, um, the first packet router, uh, that was ever built. Um, it was, you know, uh, it was a, a really cool, a really cool. Uh, moment. Now, BBN had a background in acoustics, uh, of all things. So they did the, one of the famous projects was they did the acoustics uh, calculation for the, the assembly hall of the United Nations. So when, you, when you've ever been to New York, there's this beautiful United Nations building with this large assembly hall. The guys who did the acoustics were both Berenick Newman in the 50s. And, and because and they had the, 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 the Boston Philharmonics Hall and they had a couple of really cool projects, they also did some cool projects afterwards at the Watergate scandal. They had to kind of, you know, analyze the tapes and so, but it's a cool, it's a cool story. You can read up on them. But um, 
ultimately, um, they, because of this acoustics works, they needed some processing power pretty early, um, sooner than most other folks. And they got into computers and they bought a PDB-1. Um, this is this. Uh, PD is a, a, a digital equipment corporation, and it's um, it's um, as you can see a huge host, um, and they were able to use this. They were able to do calculations with it, and they were familiar. And they've built the knowledge to you know write software, uh, which was back then you know was fairly new in the private industry, and um, yeah, so they 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 really got into that. And it's uh, still 1968, by the way. Now, there's a gentleman called Frank Hart who worked at Bolt Baronek Newman. And, and, and he was really the guy who made that project happen like on an implementation level. So there was like ARPA who had the grand vision. There was Taylor who had the wherewithal to, to figure out who to put in place for getting that project managed and like off the, the funding in it. And then there was this company, BBN, who had these great engineers these really great engineers that were able to build this thing. And Frank Hart was in the middle of that. And he was really a systems engineer kind of guy. He wasn't like so much a computer scientist, although back then it was all pretty much, you know, jumbled together. But he was really a systems kind of guy, understanding the, the, the importance of this thing being high available and of this thing working in real life conditions. And so Frank Hart is really the guy who you know, who made this happen and who built this and who kind of deployed these things. And, um, and this is how the first interface message processor looked like. So the code was written on this PDB-1 that I showed you on the last slide. Uh, but the actual hardware that would run the code was a, a Honeywell DDP-516. And I think you can still see those in the University of Santa Clara. Um, uh, at UCLA, um, sorry, uni at UCLA, um, at Leonard Kleinrock's lab, which was one of the first nodes that uh, participated in ARPANET. So I think you can still see some of the originals there. And by the way, I would like to, uh, to this one here, there's one of those, there's a, there's a PDB-1 um, running at uh, the Computer Museum in Mountain View uh, in Silicon Valley. So. If you ever make it out to the West uh, in the US, please do yourself a favor and visit the uh, Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Not only you know, can you uh, see uh, PDB-1 running, but you can, I think you can also see um, either an IMP itself or at least uh, something around that. Um, it's, really, it's really cool stuff. Now, those imps were routers, in effect. They had connections to multiple serial lines, and, um, and then they would connect to a host. Um, originally, it was just one host. Uh, later on, I think they wanted to have multiple connected, but uh, it was basically you know, uh, the first router that would translate between a host and, uh, and the network. All right, so this is the, uh, the 29th of October, 69, 2100, uh, so 9 p.m. in the evening, uh, or like half past, half past 10, there was the first communication between those two nodes on the ARPANET. Um, you know, there's supposedly this thing, <laughs> after the second letter was received, it rebooted, <laughs> as you would expect. <laughs> but, uh, but, but they were able to, you know, fix it, compile it, uh, and, uh, and get it to run so that that night they were able to, you know, get that, get that circuit and that communication link running. It's pretty cool. Um, so that was October. 29th, uh, 69. So just one year after this uh, RFQ was sent out, they were able to, um, to do the first connection test. So a little bit later, two months later, they had already three nodes, oh, sorry, four nodes online. That's uh, UCLA, uh, so UC uh, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, um, SRI, and Utah, um, with the PDB 10 hanging off there. Um, so that was an IBM machine, Sigma 7, also looks like IBM, not sure about that, and a PDP-10, a tech, a tech machine. Four nodes on the ARPANET, December 
69. All right, so this thing is growing. This thing is certainly growing. Um, there's now the East Coast, so it was usually, it was started out pretty much as a West Coast thing. Then they put the first um, the East Coast nodes on it. Um, BBN was one node, both Berlin and Newman. And by the way, BBN ran the internet or the ARPANET. They had a contract to run and operate the ARPANET uh, up until the 80s. You know, these guys were the, the original folks that ran the internet. And by the way, there were some folks that I worked with uh, at Cisco who you know, started at, at BBN. So that these, they actually existed. They're not just mystery. They actually existed. And you see, just uh, a few few years later, eight years later, there was you know a pretty sizable map of hosts available um, through these machines, and now it's becoming a real network. And the goal clearly of that was to connect research um, institutes. So it was certainly universities, with the exception of BBN, but it was the idea to connect research institutes and give folks easier access to compute resources. And that was really the ARPANET. It was not a military a, you know, intent. Um, it was really a civil um, project um, and a science and a research project more than anything else. All right, now you have all these, all these things, but who's governing, who governs that, right? Who is like, who is in charge? Um, that, that is a question that up to today, nobody has answered, uh, who is in charge with the internet. But for, for some time, you could point to this gentleman. And there was John, um, John Postel, Postel, I think uh, you pronounce it, um, who was a computer scientist and who was pretty much the guy, the god of the internet, as they called him, who was that guy who would basically um, edit RFCs, the request for comments. We, we, we come to that in a second. It's the documents that make up the standards of the internet. And you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And maybe some of you have contributed to some and some, and hopefully you have some RFCs that would be fantastic. You should, if you don't, you should. Uh, it's a great, it's a great process to be part of. And this guy at some point then was also uh, becoming the leader of the IANA, uh, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, because you got the internet, uh, somebody has to hand out addresses, somebody has to hand out, you know, autonomous system numbers and all that stuff, you know, and uh, John Postel was the most well known gentleman uh, in that. So he was a bit of a legend. Unfortunately, he passed away in 98. And uh, the other guy um, here is uh, Scott Bradner, who uh, I had the pleasure to work with um, uh, a number of times, and and he was basically his assistant and do, doing doing some work after him, and um, he did some work. Bradner did some work in Harvard. He was the, the security and IT guy in Harvard, and I met him there um, at a presentation once, and it was, it was a pleasure uh, to talk to these luminaries, um, and, and it was really good. Okay. Uh, Yana hands out the, you know, the ability to assign numbers to these sub-organizations. And I'm sure you've, you've seen that before. There's different sub-organizations. The one for Europe is the RIPE organization, and they are, they are in charge of, of these different um, geographic uh, entities. And I'm sure there are like people who you know much more, or maybe contribute to one of those, or maybe are part of, of one of those uh, organizations. And if you ever need to kind of get some provider independent address space, you know, you would go to one of these organizations and or get an AS number, then you would kind of uh, go to them and apply for that. All right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this RFCs because it's such a great tool. You know, we take it for granted, uh, but, you know, somebody had to come up with it. <laughs> and it was these guys, like, the first guys who put the internet together came up with that process. So basically a collaborative process of review and analysis and painful, you know, iterations, similar to that of the review process of scientific papers, but with the, you know, intent to come up with one version that would build a standard that implementations can be written, different implementations can be written for, and, um, 
uh, and, and then kind of connect with each other and, and interact with each other over a network. And, you know, this is RFC one, all of this stuff is, 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 you know, publicly available. This basically talks about the imp software. And I just want to give you a sense. Uh, this is April 7, 69. So before the first, obviously before the first packets were exchanged, because that was just the definition for it. And so it was a very, you know, the, the addressing, there was no TCP IP. This is like, uh, uh, this is six years before TCP IP was even a term or a paper came out. And this was about um, 15 years before TCP IP would be put on the internet, right? So it was, the, that was much later that TCP IP was put on the ARPANET. Um, but at this point in time, it was um, the, the, I think NLP, um, that was the network link protocol that was the, the, the protocol of choice for ARPANET. And it was very simplistic. There was a destination, um, you know, field. Um, there was a link kind of a, a, you know, a subdivider and some operational OEM bits and, and so on to be able to connect to hosts. And this would allow you to press, get a terminal session to a host and then, you know, send messages to that host. That's how primitive, you know, it was for about 15 years. So there's a whole bunch of things, you know, where they talk about and where they very understandably explain how this stuff works. Again, RFC one and following, it's a good, just good, good use of your time to read. Uh, these guys have been really good in being clear uh, about these things. All right. Um, so this stuff grows and grows and uh, NSFnet, kind of a research net that at some point merges with ARPANET. And um, this is a little bit, uh, you know, this is a little bit the, the, the time history here. So ARPANET uh, working group starts 68. At 69, the first packet is exchanged uh, between uh, nodes. And then we go on that spectrum and in the 80s, um, here, 82, uh, 82, 83, there's a transition to TCP IP happening. Okay, so this is like, this takes almost 15 years to go to TCP IP. Um, and then from then on, there's the com commercialization happening in the early 90s. Um, the, the, the massive event, I think, in telecommunication history was the breakup of AT&T in 84, where the you know, Sprint, uh, MCI Sprint was created that kind of shook up the whole telecommunication landscape. And, and then later on, that also trickled into opening up access uh, to the internet in the early 90s. Okay, there's a little bit of noise on the line. So if you, uh, if you can, um, it would be good if you can mute yourself or if you have a question, then to mute. Um, I think I can mute him out. Just a second. Perfect. Super. Okay. Um, all right. So we are moving into the 80s. Um, all right. So it's uh, it's about it's the, it's the early 80s uh, and and Stanford. Uh, it's the Stanford University in the middle of Silicon Valley. Uh, the, the most, I would say, certainly the most influencing, influencing uh, university there. Uh, it's a great campus. Also, if you have a chance to go there, just check it out. Uh, you're, it's, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be in awe how beautiful it is. You'll also be a little bit, you know, think all these guys have these great, uh, great buildings. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good place. Um, um, what they wanted to solve is they had local networks, a bunch of local networks. Um, they had a lo local labs and they needed something to connect these labs. Um, so there was a gentleman called Bill Yeager who worked for Stanford. He was actually the medical branch, uh, medical uh, program of Stanford, a research scientist. And, and he was kind of, he was into computers and, and, and he wrote a software that was able to basically get a packet from one interface from one subnet into another subnet. Now that doesn't sound like much, but it, 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 commercially that stuff wasn't available. You couldn't buy it, you know, you couldn't buy it. You could buy 
maybe the components to build something like that, but you couldn't buy it off the shelf. And then what they also had to build themselves was the Ethernet card that kind of would connect uh, to those networks. So basically, they came up with a blue box. That's what, how they called it. Um, it's a bl blue box, and, um, and that was able to basically extend their networks. They called it network extender, um, you know, extension cord. And, and, and they kind of they had this deployed, I think, in the dozens or so you know, on the Stanford campus. Um, and, uh, you know, they had these, these uh, uh, machine, these Palo Alto machines, uh, these uh, Park machines, the Alto machine from uh, Xerox, and they would have Ethernet and they would connect to those boxes and, you know, and the first Ethernet cards would pop up in the early 80s. All right, and so there was other folks in the Stanford, uh, you know, in the Stanford group, um, Len Bosek and Sandy Lerner, um, and a guy Kurt, called Kurt Lougheed. Um, and these guys were like, this looks like a real cool thing. You know, we would like to build a product out of that. And, and basically they went to Stanford and said, hey, Stanford, you got this cool blue box that you use for your network extension cords. Uh, can, we, can we build a company? And Stanford said, no, you can't. Uh, it's us, it's ours. Uh, you know, you can uh, you know, pound salt, as they say. Um, and, uh, and, and Bosek and Lerner and Lohit, and these guys were like, you know what? Screw you guys, we'll just do it anyway. And, uh, and they basically take, took the code from Bill Yeager, who wrote that code. They removed the multi-protocol stuff. Uh, they just kept the IP stuff. Later, they put the multi-protocol, their own multi-protocol in. But like, it was basically the IP routing source that they took from Bill Yeager with the you know, basic OS part of it. And, and they took the blueprints from the from the cards, from the network cards that the Stanford guys designed. And the guy who designed them is Andy Bechtholzheim, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. But, um, you know, so basically they stole it. Let's be clear. So like they, they just took it, they, they, were, they, they knew they weren't allowed to take it, uh, but, uh, but they took it and, and they started the business. And, and in the middle, like in the second half of the 80s, this thing, was it was becoming clear that this was selling like gangbusters. They were like, they started in their living room producing this stuff and uh, just soldering these things. But quickly it became clear, like this is, this is a real business. Like that wasn't clear in the mid eighties. That wasn't clear that this could be a, a real business, but it became clear in the second half of the eighties that this is, uh, this is crazy. This could go gangbusters. Okay. So, um, there is a long back and forth story between Cisco and Stanford. Uh, they were kind of threatening, Stanford was threatening to sue them, blah, 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 and back and forth. In the end, they found a solution. Um, uh, Cisco paid a license fee to Stanford, a very small license fee, by the way, extremely small. Um, and they gave them $150,000 credit in products and support. Uh, and that's how they, they got out of it. And and I have to say, it's, it's a pretty gutsy move. Um, you know, it, it was a pretty gutsy move. And I think with Stanford got the, the short end of the stick here, for sure. And, and Cisco went off and then, you know, uh, started to get real serious funding from Sequoia. That's one of the largest uh, VC companies in the Valley. And um, Sequoia put money in, and then this thing blew up. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's one of the largest IT companies, as you know, today. And while they had their ups and downs, they're still, it's still a phenomenal company. And uh, if you have a chance to work for them or with them, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely worth it. It's a good company. I can say that from 18 years experience. Um, all right. So these are a couple of my colleagues. We, we did a little uh, trip with the ship. And the, the guy on the left here with the camera, that's Kirk Lougheed. He's the guy, you know, who took the software. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, later on, we, we, I had the, the big uh, privilege to work with this guy in the same team, which was just amazing. Okay. All right. All right. So, next gentleman. Um, this is Andy Bechtholzheim. And 
Andy Bechtelsheim, the first time I mentioned him was, he was the guy who built the cards, the, you know, the, the Ethernet cards in the, in the blue boxes. Um, those blue boxes that Stanford produced and that later Cisco lifted and, uh, and to build the first router. So that was Mr. Bechtelsheim. And uh, Bechtelsheim was originally from Germany, you know, doesn't speak German very well anymore, but, uh, uh, but, but um, um, he went on to be the founder of Sun, and, uh, which is obviously an amazing company. Um, unfortunately, got sold later on. And it, but now, by the way, uh, Facebook is in the, the, uh, located in the campus that uh, Sun has built. And uh, it's a very cool campus. You should also check it out if you're in the area. Um, Becht, uh, Bechtholzheim is a luminary. Um, I, <laughs> was, so I, I was in the early 2000s. I was a lowly, like the lowest of the lowest ranks uh, at, uh, at the local sales team at Cisco. And, um, and I had a project um, and it, it was effective, like it was related to his, uh, to his product that got acquired by Cisco. And it was like uh, one, af one afternoon I, um, or one, one evening, I got a call uh, from a US number. And, uh, and there's this guy on the line said, hey, I'm Andy Bechtelsheim. I got a couple of questions about this project that you are having. And I'm like, what is happening to me? Uh, this is a prank or something like that. And, and it turned out he was like, he wanted to see, he was asking me a bunch of really good technical questions. And he wanted to see if this is real, if he should ask his team to build that stuff that we wanted or needed there. And, um, and so he called me directly. And I mean, just how should I say, like, first of all, that he is, um, calling a lowly person somewhere to get some stuff verified, I think is fantastic. I think that's how you have to do it all the time. You just got to reach out, figure it out yourself. Don't rely on secondhand information. Get the stuff that you need to know yourself. Get your own, get the picture yourself. Only trust, you know, what you can, <laughs> what you have, uh, uh, not only, but the really trust stuff that you have can ask firsthand. Everything else is gets, you know, gets shifted and, and, you know, gets its own spin through the organization. So really go through this, so to the source to get the info. And the fact that he was so close to the business that he was like overseeing that decision to build that line card or not, uh, was just like, that's exactly how successful people operate. And I, you know, just, I felt extremely happy that I was able to talk to this guy. Um, this gentleman also made a lot of really good investment decisions, but probably the best investment decision was to give a check for a hundred thousand dollars to uh, two unknown people in uh, I think '98 or something that uh, later on uh, founded Google, and it, they gave he, he gave them the check in a cafe in in Palo Alto before Google was incorporated. So the thing said Google Inc on it, but uh, that company didn't exist yet. So he just gave them a hundred grand and said, you know. I think it's going to pan out. Yeah, I trust you guys. And uh, that is many, many, many billions of uh, dollars today. I think it was more than 2 billion in 2010. So you can imagine how much it is now. Not that that's, you know, the only important thing, but it's a great uh, choice of investment. <laughs> so this guy is fantastic. All right. Another really interesting gentleman is this, uh, Bob Metcalf. Um, Metcalf was the the guy who came up with Ethernet in 73. Um, and it's another paper that I really would suggest you read because it's also really dense uh, in the sense that all the important points are there, no fluff. Uh, it's a great concept laid out in a very short uh, amount of time and it's, uh, it's breathtaking. Now, by the way, this is also, how should I say, a pretty good uh, example for he had one really good um, throw with Ethernet, but then he also kind of had a couple of, uh, you know, uh, wrong predictions. So famously, he's like a big open source uh, critic saying that open source and Linux is all bullshit, you know, and just, uh, you know, communist propaganda. Uh, but uh, that turned out to be um, quite wrong with uh, the world running on Linux today. But, but certainly an interesting uh, gentleman as well. And this is the paper 
Uh, he was working at Xerox at the time. And uh, check it out. It's worth, it's worth reading. It's really cool. He, so he basically hand drew that, uh, that thing and introduced the concept of the ether um, that he would later on use for ethernet. All right, now we are um, at uh, the two gentlemen, um, Vint Surf and Bob Can, And those two guys uh, came up with a seminal paper in 1975 uh, about uh, TCP IP. And, and, and TCP IP, as you know, uh, was then later in the 80s adopted to become the protocol um, that would operate the ARPANET and later on in the internet. And uh, there's, I think certainly Vint Cerf is very well known. He's working at Google today. He's a, you know, I saw him speak once. He's a great, great speaker, a gentle soul and a super smart guy. Um, so well worth uh, checking him out as well, if you haven't heard about him. That's the paper. Um, and, you know, uh, also, you know, very few people are able to design technology in, the, in 75 that up to this day would be the essence for communication in the whole world. It's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. Okay, so IPv4 header, this is what they came up with. IPv6 header was basically an extended, you know, form of that. You could argue there's a couple of new features in there, but yeah, you know, it's a little bit more address space. I, I, I get flamed for that pretty soon. Hey, by the way, I have uh, <laughs> I've predicted the death of IPv4 in, in multiple presentations, uh, 99, 2000, uh, 2001, uh, the imminent death of IPv4 and the running out of address space. Uh, I've predicted that 20 years ago. Over the years, I've been proven wrong over and over again. And so I've, I've kind of stopped making those predictions. Um, and, uh, you know, slowly we are moving to V6, but V4 will be with us for many, many years to come. All right, TCP UDP. Um, you have I think many more opportunities to learn about these protocols, test them out, uh, run a Wireshark, uh, which by the way, you should do anyway. Uh, use Wireshark uh, often and extensively. It's, uh, it's awesome. All right, so that concludes the first part. Um, uh, now I'm gonna shift focus a little bit from uh, pure storytelling to uh, a little bit more, um, you know, um, tangibles, if I like, maybe. Um, so I'm going to talk about some protocols that, that dominated that phase of the internet and, and some of them are still with us and some of them are long gone. Um, so let me dive into that. So, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, people were kind of really worked up on OC, OSI model versus TCP IP model. You had these wars going on of people in the ISIS camp who would kind of be the OSI model folks, was the seven layer model. And then you would have the TCP IP model folks and they would kind of fight wars and like there would factions, like in at and you know, I've heard, it was a little bit before my time, but I heard there were like vicious wars uh, if they should use IC, ISIS or uh, OSPF and the TCP crew won, they're using OSPF. And um, funny story, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell that, but I, I think I can. Um, there's just like this gentleman in uh, Slovakia, Peter Psenek. Um, I'm not sure, maybe, I don't know, Peter, if you're here. Uh, <laughs> but if you're not, you should at least uh, have heard about him. He's like, uh, he's the guy who, you know, basically is uh, running OSPF uh, for Cisco. And, uh, and, and so when there was a real problem, you know, at, at, at AT&T, you know, they would fly Peter in and, and he would kind of explain how the world works and then he would fly out again and, you know, AT&T would be happy and settled again. At the problems we are like, okay, is this LSA flooding? Like, what is the limit? How does the algorithm work? If we have too, too many LSAs, where should we block the LSAs? How should we build the area concept? All these kind of really, you know, tricky stuff if you have thousands and thousands of nodes and, 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 and tens of thousands of routes. Um, yeah, so Slovakia rules. Um, autonomous systems in the internet. Um, 
So pretty quickly, it became clear you need to have some kind of administrative boundaries of folks who are kind of responsible for addressing, maintaining those addresses and announcing those addresses. So you'd have certain admin, yeah, autonomous systems. They would kind of manage everything inside. They would kind of handle themselves and they would have to have some kind of, you know, outer communication and to talk to everybody else how they are reachable and via which paths they are reachable. And that, in essence, is how the internet is formed. That's kind of the, the level of hierarchies. Um, it's actually one level of hierarchy, if you like, right? It's the autonomous systems. It's the amalgamation of autonomous systems and the border gateway protocol that communicates reachability into those autonomous systems across the network that forms the internet. And within those autonomous systems, you have all kinds of, uh, you know, proprietary or, or non-proprietary or open uh, protocols that make sure you reach the networks within and you react uh, fairly quickly to what happens. Now, BGP originally, yeah, so BGP to this day is the uh, kind of mechanism to glue the internet together. And then, you know, every now and then there's kind of voices, oh, this is like broken and like you need to have, you know, this or that, but in essence, like since since the last I don't know thirty years, BGP has been keeping the internet together and has done done a, a pretty good job if you think about it. That plus DNS um, that glues the internet together are really good. All right, so that's how BGP got designed. <laughs> it's like two folks, um, Yakov Rector and Kirk Lougheed. This there's Kirk again, uh, and and. Um, these two guys were drawing on their napkins and it's literally napkins that they drew this on and that's the state diagram you know open uh, wait uh, disconnect established and so on so you see those states they exist still up to this day right if you do a show pgp status or whatever the command is or show pgp neighbor status then uh, you kind of can see those neighbor states and and, and your own states and it's, it's pretty cool it's pretty cool um that there is a place, and I've forgotten where, but these, they still exist. It might be in the Computer History Museum, or it might be somewhere at Cisco that, that, that these exist. Uh, but um, so paper napkins, you know, are a good uh, source material for technical drawings. Yeah, and of course, then things completely grew out of hand. And, uh, and uh, by now, all this, this is already five years old. So by now, this is like, Again, much, much bigger, many, many, for, many, many more autonomous systems, many more addresses. Um, things are definitely growing in the V6 space, but IPv4 is not going to be anytime soon. Now, BGP is awesome. Um, if you are a network nerd, you will get to love BGP or hate it, uh, but you will have a relationship with BGP, I can assure you that. And, and there is multiple implementations uh, out there and there are the vendor implementations like uh, Cisco's, Juniper's, um, Alcatel's. So there's a couple of good implementations out there. And, uh, and by the way, within those vendors, there are multiple implementations, right? So there's not just like, and, and well, why is that important? Because it's the essence of the internet. Uh, if you put a router with a, you know, that's not that, that has a faulty PGP implementation onto the internet, bad things can happen. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the best case, you kill yourself, but in the worst case, you can do harm to others. So that's why BGP has a certain cachet in the, in the world of networking nerds uh, like myself. And, uh, you know, and there's a bunch of implementations out there. One nice one is this Go BGP implementation, um, not just because it's Go and that's cool and sexy, but I think it's also um, good to, to work with. All right. Over the course of the over course of time, there have been additional protocols creeping in, and and you know I'm going to talk about some of those. Um, Multi-protocol label switching has been MPLS has been something that has been used by providers, but also also by many corporations to you know build an abstraction between the forwarding and the, the control plane. Um, those labels can encapsulate uh, you know different things like the, the forwarding equivalency class where you can have a label is kind of equivalent with a prefix. Um, you can have segments, which are kind of arbitrary places, either links or nodes that the label encapsulates. Um, 
you could have private routing tables that the label could point you to a private routing table. And you can have used the label to encapsulate layer two information. So that was a really useful thing to kind of have a data plane that's very, effect, very efficient, very fast, that works with fixed length, um, uh, pack, uh, like um, fixed length um, pieces of information to make the forwarding decision on. Um, unlike the header, which can grow with kind of header options and so on. But these labels have the advantage of being fixed length and you can do very fast things with those, uh, with that. Segment routing is pretty sexy still after, you know, I would say like five years, being around for five years, I think it still, you know, has a lot of attention. I think it's being used by folks like Google, um, other large operators and uh, be happy to you know, expand on that more, maybe in a different context, if there is interest. All right. That was the second part where I talked a little bit about all these kind of protocols. Um, I didn't go into the depth of any, maybe with the exception of BGP, a little bit the history, but it should give you an idea how this fits together and about the hierarchy of the internet and, and what protocols are used there. And then you know, if you are, you've been alive uh, over the last 10 years, you have heard the word uh, software defined networking, um, uh, at least alive in that space. And, and what is that? So here you have a, a bunch of uh, ladies uh, at a, you know, um, some time in the last century at a switching switchboard. And, and the connections, it was connection oriented, obviously, and, and those connections would be established manually based on, you know, some information that they would get or they would have available to them. But it was a manual connection establishment and that would then be morphed into these beautiful uh, cupboards, uh, wardrobes, um, which would be, you know, the Lucens and the Alcatels and, and the, Nor Nor the Nortels of this world, uh, who would, or the Siemens of this world who would build them. And uh, those would be switching systems, um, switching telephone connections, and and, and it's all connection oriented. And and typically there was a switch matrix that would kind of handle the data plane, and then there was a you know control plane that was kind of separate from that that would handle the forwarding information, right? So there would be a fixed routing table, and uh, you would load the routing table, and then that would be the the basis for setting up connections in the data plane. So it's kind of this, this is where this notion of data plane and control, control plane comes from. It's telephony switches. And, and, and they then had a, you know, some uh, protocols that would kind of run between those control planes. It was most notably SS7, signaling system seven, that would kind of establish and, and, and communicate routing information in essence for those fixed static switched or circuit switched connections. So um, SS7 is the routing protocol of telephony switches, if you like. And if there's a kind of a real telephony telecommunications person here, they'd probably, they'll send me angry emails uh, uh, afterwards, but in, in another very simplified notion that is true. Um, and then when you looked at old routers, like or still some small routers today, everything is happening in the CPU, right? You have a CPU and like if you send a packet in it, uh, you know, you get an interrupt and that, then there's some table and it looks it up, but it all happens in the same CPU. You, so the packet forwarding slice time slice has to be shared with, you know, control plane time slice on that, on that CPU. So if you, in essence, if you have a lot of, um, uh, if you have a lot of, um, a packet um, traffic, you would kind of starve out the control plane and that would be bad. And it has happened to us many times before that you would kind of <laughs> kill, kill a router because of overload. Um, now, for that reason and many others, uh, that was kind of separated and you have a, a CPU dealing with the uh, routing information, with the control information of the router, uh, with all the configuration settings, and then you would have like ASICs typically uh, purpose-built ASICs to deal with the forwarding plane. So all modern routers up at a certain speed would kind of fall under this category. And then I think over time people figured what would be really cool is because the Cisco's and the Junipers and the Aristas and, and, and everybody or 
and the Alcatels have built this combined monster routers. They have control plane, bunch of routing protocols, and 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 the data plane. It was all theirs, right? You couldn't get in there and do like augment it or like it was like one monolithic thing, and it still is. Um, and 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 people were, you know, we we got to do something faster because. This, if I if I'm a really large customer and I tell Cisco I need a new feature, by the time it gets coded, gets tested, it gets released, by the time I can test it and deploy it, two years are gone. And people said that's not acceptable. Like we need to react faster. And and it was really um, it was really the Googles and the Facebooks and and these guys who said you know screw that. We just like we're not going to wait for two years for for a feature. We need that now. We need to grow now. And, uh, and also from a bandwidth capacity perspective, you have no vision how you get us where we need to be. So they said, okay, let's disaggregate that. Uh, we build our own control plane and we'll buy some you know, data plane off the shelf. And, and that was really starting this, the disaggregation uh, movement. Um, and, and if you look today at the Amazons, uh, the Googles and the Facebooks and the other very large and Microsoft, that the hyperscalers, they all built their own hardware and their own control plane software. It's, uh, that, that market is gone for, for the Cisco's and, and Junipers of this world. They all built their own thing. And it's also always built by some uh, OEMs, um, Edge Core, um, or the, the Acton, uh, the parent of, of Edge Core being a, being a big one, but there is others, obviously, as well. All right. Um, so there's different types of data plane abstraction. Um, what do I mean with that? So, you know, you can abstract the data plane on, on, on different levels. And the, the choice that you make for that abstraction is, is pretty critical in, in your, uh, what you can do and how fast you can do it. And, and so you can abstract data plane in like an outgoing interface in it, most simplistic, you know. So if you come in with that destination IP, a MAC address, you know, put that MAC address on and go out this interface, um, and then you do that rewrite. Uh, or it could be an, a, a next a recursive um, abstraction where you go to a next hop IP address, and then you got to recursively resolve that. Okay, and what outgoing interface is that, and what MAC rewrite is that? Or it could be a tunnel. Uh, you know, even where you have maybe multiple recursions happening um, to kind of find the actual um, rewrite string. Now, in late, I think in around 2009, there were a couple of folks in Stanford, and there we are again, Stanford, uh, the arch enemy, Cisco's arch enemy. Uh, the Stanford guy said, screw Cisco, now we got you. We're going we gonna to build something that you know, com completely uh, opens you up. We're going to create an open flow, which is kind of a protocol that allows us to kind of have a standardized way to talk directly to the forwarding hardware. And... Uh, you know, uh, I think this was a very good academic idea, um, but uh, with literally very little success in the in the industry, in real products. Uh, if you want to, yeah, you can't point to very little actual implementations of that. It turns out it's not a good abstraction. The flow-based abstraction level is not a good abstraction. Um, it's too low um, and. You know, the churn that you see in, 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 in larger environments is just not manageably in an easy, in a simple way across many data planes. And, um, and it's easier to implement that in a proprietary way where you can be in full control over the optimizations that you need to do to effectively upload a lot of information that's changing in a high rate to, uh, to ASICs. So these things usually worked in the lab, but then when there would be changes and rerouting events, it would be very hard to get them to act fast. And the other thing was this idea that we had like multiple ASICs that would be, that you could take and switch with each other didn't pan out because everybody, every ASIC would have different match tables and different behaviors of those switch vendors. So did not pan out. Uh, open floor today is pretty much dead. Now, there's a successor to that with P4 and uh, the same guys, basically, let's be honest. Uh, it's Nick McEwen, who is a professor at Stanford and has a fantastic track record in selling companies. Um, this last one he sold to Intel 
Um, and the, the previous one, Nicira, he sold to VMware, and uh, he's a very rich guy. But uh, you know, we'll I'll, I'll stay I'll stay put. I think it would be you know need some smart people like yourself to see can this be put to put use in real products. I'll I'll sit there and wait and let you guys figure this out. Um, now, open source. Now, I mentioned to you, uh, open source is uh, something that uh, you know, people in the beginning looked like, uh, is this a communist experiment? Like, what, what, are these, like, what are these guys doing? They're sharing stuff. They're not, there's no patents. There's no license. So um, they, they were kind of confused between free software and open source. And it kind of took a while for this to shake out, to kind of have a kind of good understanding of what's going on. By now, open source is generally, you know, this is the thing that you build upon. There is, you know, you would build proprietary things on top of open source substrates. I think that would be very common. We do that in our company. Many others do that who want to have a commercial business model other than support. But uh, if you have a product-centric business model, there needs to be something that is secret. Um, there's, no, there's no secrecy about that. But, you know, um, Open source allows this model proprietary on top of open source, but allows also full open source. And it has shaken out. There were some kind of wrong directions with certain license types that didn't go anywhere. So I'll give you a quick rundown. Um, there is permissive licenses. Um, and typically, that's what you want to use in your project. Those permissive licenses are you know, typically Apache, V2, MIT licenses, BSD to some extent. Um, and, and those basically say in different words, but they say as much as you can do anything with that stuff. Some require you put some labels in or put some, some text in, but in general, you can do anything with that stuff, use it commercially, non-commercially, and there is no liability. The larger, that's, that's a very simplified version of those permissive licenses. And there are no requirements to publish, or no requirements to you know, share the code if you build something on top of it. And then there is kind of these non-permissive licenses. And the worst offender is GPL v3. And, and that is basically making it impossible or making it very hard to build a, you know, a, a, a proprietary product in conjunction with GPL v3 code. So I can tell you out of experience that whenever you have an open source component, there would be a legal check if you sell something to another company. Uh, and that would check for GPL v3. If you have GPL v3 content, you're basically out of business. You can't sell it. So just uh, you know, take a note. Don't use GPL v3 if you want to sell something. If you want to just do it for fun, shits and giggles, as they say, then please uh, go ahead. Uh, but if you want to sell it, don't use GPL v3. All right. In the past, uh, AT&T um, had a policy where they were not allowed to use open source because it was too dangerous. It was not clear, like what type of license, they didn't understand that. And in, in 2017, they, they, most remarkably with China Mobile, that was obviously, uh, was a long, feels like a long time ago, um, and they worked with the Linux Foundation on a, on a joint uh, network provisioning automation product project called Onet. Linux Foundation is, a, is an interesting place. They basically pay um, uh, Linus Torvalds to kind of do his stuff largely. He used to work for some companies, but that didn't pan out. So it doesn't seem to be an easy employer to like <laughs> to work with. But but he's a genius. So you know, some people got together and figured out, okay, we got to pay this guy to keep doing what he's doing, and and he's great at that. And and let's give him a, an environment to do that. And that's the Linux Foundation. And then uh, the guys who built that are super smart, um, uh, and and they kind of built many offspring projects. Um, you know, Kubernetes is hosted in one of the Linux Foundation uh, projects. Uh, many other things are hosted there. It's a smorgasbord. It's an incredibly large amount of projects, some niche, some really important, but it's a great place uh, to, to go and look and understand open source. We, have a, we, we do stuff with open daylight. And what I do, uh, what I want to share a little bit at the this is the last part of, of today's session is uh you know how is this evolving how is this whole thing evolving from a hyperscaler perspective and you'll see most of the stuff uh, coming from facebook 
not only because they are a customer of ours, we are proud of that, but they also are the most, uh, they share the most stuff uh, with the outside world. They have uh, three big initiatives, um, Connectivity Lab, uh, tel Telecom Infra Project, and OCP. And uh, under those vehicles, they, they kind of, they produce a lot of open uh, source um, hardware, um, uh, software, and, and under that context, we also contribute uh, to their activities. It's a, it's, it's a real good thing. None of the other big ones do it in that way. Amazon is the worst in terms of secrecy. Like the Amazon, the poor Amazon, once you work with Amazon, you are silent. You will no longer talk at any conference. You will no longer basically make a public statement. You know, uh, Amazon is the, you know, the most secretive one in terms of how they use technology. It's, they, they see it as a company secret, um, rightfully so, um, but they are really enforcing it more than anybody else. So Amazon is certainly on the extreme. Um, then you have Google, which are, you know, very strategic uh, in how they use open source. They have large portions, the majority of the things that they keep for themselves, but then they have very important strategic projects that they open source. Um, uh, they, they, they are great with that, and I'm sure many of you use, use portions of Google code. Um, but they're not as forthcoming with how they use their own, what they use for their own infrastructure, um, uh, like Facebook is. So hence, you see a lot of information from Facebook because it's publicly available. Um, yeah, so I think one of the, 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 the key things that you'll see in how network devices are built. So you remember this first router, this imp, you know, this Honeywell DDP 516, this, this is a single, you know, a single, you know, military grade, by the way, military grade machine um, that was processing packets and, and, and routing packets. And obviously these things became larger and larger. And I was part of that time when we built multi-chassis routers. So we'd have this like 16 or eight chassis with a switch fabric in the middle. So we had nine racks and that would be one, like one physical, uh, one logical router. It was, it was absurd. It was, it was really, really crazy. And it was super expensive to manufacture and it was hard to, to run. Um, by the way, <laughs> a quick detour with AT&T, they have, uh, they have, they are very proud and they should be about their ability to do disaster recovery. And they have this big warehouse in New Jersey, somewhere in the woods in New Jersey. Um, and yet I don't think you're about to say where it is. It's like, it's huge and it has um, trucks that are preloaded with routers and switches and telecommunication equipment. So it's dozens of trucks and it's, you know, big, um, uh, the, things that they can put in airplanes. Um, I'm not even sure, like it's like this, these shipping containers that fit directly in, in, in certain types of military airplanes. So, and these things are all preloaded and running actually. So they are sucking, you know, they're, they're, they're hot, they're sucking power and they're standing in this, in this, uh, in this warehouse and they are basically staged for a disaster. So, you know, should the disaster strike, you know, they ship these out, they have these trucks going. And they actually, they, they, they did a couple of times when Katrina happened, uh, you know, those trucks were on the, on, on the way. And uh, when a, an earthquake in South America happened, they, they sent the planes. So, you know, when they lose a pop, you know, they would send a truck. And, and obviously that was after 9-11 that this thing was put in place because, you know, what, I mean, I'm not sure you know, but 9-11, but they hit a switching center. Uh, in one in 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 one of the World Trade Centers in the in the in the basement was a switching center and and that pretty much downed the communication of whole you know South Manhattan. Uh, so not obviously the loss of life was terrible, but also like the efforts that it took to kind of get communication running again was uh, was pretty bad. Based on that experience, they they built this huge uh, fleet of uh, disaster recovery trucks. Okay, little detour, but. Those were like large multi-chassis systems, and uh, and that would only go so far. That would work until I'd say, I don't know, ten years ago, five years ago, something like that. And then people would, would kind of 
10 years ago, the hyperscalers were starting to, to kind of redesign. And then maybe five years ago, also the telcos were starting to redesign this. Um, and they were kind of going into these gloss fabrics where you have like more off the shelf um, components for the crossbar. And then you'd have like edge components or leaves that would hang off those crossbars. And they would be connected not with kind of proprietary high end uh, gold plated uh, optical lines, but they would be um, Ethernet ports uh, and that would be Ethernet fabrics as well. So those typically those would previously in the old times, this would be very ATM cell like switching fabrics that was super expensive and like oh, very custom ASICs and everything. And this was kind of, you know, has migrated into a, a world where this is all Ethernet off the shelf Broadcom or similar ASICs um, for, the, for the crossbar for the spines, as they, this layer is called, as well as the leaves. Yeah, and you can scale this pretty good. Uh, you can scale this so also in multiple hierarchies, not only two, but multiple hierarchies um, to work well. And then you basically have a situation. Uh, and then there's a gentleman, I think he works at uh, Facebook now, Peter Laputo, uh, who basically wrote a great uh, paper on, hey, why don't we use BGP, you know? across those elements, across these leaf spine elements and, and you know, use just one protocol to get the routing information across these fabrics. And that's what a lot of these guys do now. So they have like basically one tor, top of rack switch is now represented by one autonomous system and they're using eBGP. So the protocol between autonomous systems, the one that built the internet uh, between those devices um, and uh, to, to distribute the routing information. And then they used a couple of tricks and tweaks to make that uh, react fast because, you know, eBGP was built in a way that it's not fast reacting and you had, we had to put a good amount of tweaks in over the years to make it uh, not only stable, but also stable and fast and not make those two contradict each other. So that was over the course of the years made that happen. All right, going coming uh, closer to the end here. Um, one of the observations is that you know while the machine to user traffic is always growing, and so don't don't underestimate that. But what's really crazy uh, <laughs> in its uptick is the machine to machine traffic and the number of nodes on the network that basically where machines are talking to machines. So it's a, a one to ten ratio. You know, whenever it's it's, it's enormous. And by the way, a quick uh, quick sidebar. It, Facebook, since many years, is IPv6 only internally. When you go to a fa Facebook office, it, it happened to us uh, recently, we kind of did some uh, uh, POC demo thing and, uh, and we plugged ourselves in and see, only, only V6, no, no V4. Um, so they are, they are, they're really, they're, they're, they are hardcore about their V6 uh, readiness. They have written their own V4, V6 translations uh, that are kind of, at the edge of their network. So when you, you know, get content from uh, Facebook via a V4 connection, you get translated into C V6 requests. And there's this pub, this is published, um, by the way, you can look at it and, and they've done a nice job. Um, and, and it's only V6 uh, traffic internally. All right, and if you have these types of traffic growth, then this, this is the kind of the type of data center this will drive, um, you know, uh, obviously pretty enormous. But in the case of Facebook, they are also very forthcoming in how they build those. Um, it's, it's really amazing in like how much information they are sharing. And, and you know, it, that would be hard to, like you would never get that out of Amazon with that level of detail and accuracy, or not accuracy, but like at least that level of detail. So um, this is how it looks like in the end. This is how kind of the data centers they are planned with the leaves and spines and the multiple planes that they that they use to kind of scale that up, uh, up and out. All right. Um, so I took you on a journey from you know the 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 pl planar uh, transistor in forty seven um, through the folks who envisioned all this stuff that we live in today, which it didn't exist yet, but they envisioned it for some great reason. They had the minds to, to be able to articulate how it could be. 
And then I told, told you about the folks who actually put it in, made it real, uh, like Bob Taylor and many others, and, and how that came to be, how they built the first router, uh, both Berenek and Newman, um, and, and how they got this contract, which was amazing for this little company out of Massachusetts. They pulled it off. And, and then I, I, I mentioned how that grew into, you know, more, more sophisticated protocols and how early, you know, those protocols were developed that are still with us, um, like TCP IP and, uh, and, and, and BGB. And, and, and then I talked a little bit about the, the more recent developments in scaling these systems up, which still take advantage of a lot of these building blocks uh, that I mentioned to you earlier in the presentation. And then kind of I closed out on, you know, some of these SDN ideas and uh, SDN proposals. And the last part here, I showed you how the hyperscalers are uh, basically changing the trajectory by no longer relying on, on vendors, but building their own stuff and having, you know, um, the ability to scale to their needs and in, a, in essence, building little internets uh, in their data centers, but still using the same technology and building block that these guys came up with in the 60s and 70s and gals, obviously. So I hope you enjoyed the ride. Um, I certainly, I love to talk about this stuff as you probably uh, realized. Uh, so don't be shy, shoot me an email or like if you have some questions, I'd love to answer them uh, after this conversation. Um, and uh, you know, would all you know, obviously love to meet you in person at some point when, uh, when the, the Corona situation allows for it. But meanwhile, thank you. And uh, Thomas, back to you for a Q and A in case there are any questions. Yeah, thank you very much Gopher, for your presentation. Uh, so if there's any questions, uh, feel free to unmute your mic and we'll go ahead. Just one little remark that uh, that one sentence when, where basically it was said that people would more efficiently talk to each other uh, via the machines as opposed to face to face. Well, it's not only that, but right now, basically, that's the only way to talk. <laughs> we cannot talk face to face pretty much. So what would we do if we didn't have this? So That's very accurate. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So true. So true. Yeah, no, I'm I'm amazed by the uh, by the prescience that these guys had, um, you know, back in the day to kind of envision all the things that are so, you know, natural for us. And sometimes I think, do we are we kind of forward looking enough, you know, in a way that these guys have been envisioning uh, changes? So are we kind of, you know, um, do we have enough will to think that far ahead? It feels like our thinking is more has shrunk, right? The, the you know, in a in a more tactical way, as opposed to you know um, what could be possible based on all the technology. Or maybe it's so scary now that you know we, we don't we don't uh, we don't dare to. <laughs> well, on the other hand, it was always always a lot of extremely forward-looking people, uh, but. You only know uh, in retrospect which of those ideas were forward looking and which was just completely, you know, sci-fi. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. They, they, like yeah, yeah. yeah. So, because really, if you look back, a lot of these things have been in sci-fi novels even dec decades before, basically. So that's true. That's absolutely true. That's true. That's why sci-fi is good. <laughs> <laughs> and those guys didn't really seriously know where this would happen, but these guys, they expected this to happen soon and quite high certainty. So yeah. it's a difference to write a research paper and to write a, write a sci-fi novel. So. That's right. That's right. Good. Um... All right, so the, if there are no questions, then I'd like to really uh, thank Gerhard again uh, for the presentation and also like to thank Andre for inviting Gerhard uh, for this initial presentation. And uh, so basically that's it for today's lecture. 
Uh, I would like to ask those students who are actually enrolled in this lecture to stay a little bit longer and the uh, rest of us, rest of you, you can leave for now. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much.